This is a surveillance tool and it's disguised as a payment mechanism. As communist China is rolling out its new digital currency, it's going to allow the People's Bank of China to peer into everyone's purchasing history. The Chinese regime may strong arm other nations into adopting the Chinese digital yuan, says Eric Bethel, a global finance professional who served as the U.S. representative to the World Bank. Imagine the digital Chinese currency being exported to authoritarian regimes around the world. Think of Venezuela or Cuba or North Korea or Iran. He argues that the digital yuan could eventually threaten the U.S. dollar's role as the world reserve currency with devastating consequences. This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kelleg. Eric Bethel, such a pleasure to have you on American Thought Leaders. Great to be here. Thanks. Eric, we're at the eve of the Olympic Games in Beijing. We're also a few day, just a few days away from China adopting its new digital yuan, mm -hmm. which is, they say, going to revolutionize everything. And many people, including yourself, are a bit concerned about it. But before we go there, why don't you tell us, like, why are you interested in digital currencies in the first place, and frankly, just the whole China economic picture? I began my journey in digital currencies when I was serving as the U.S. Uh, representative at the World Bank. I found that what the World Bank was doing was deploying um, close to $100 billion per year to help get people out of poverty, but only a fraction of that money was actually getting to its intended end beneficiary through perhaps you know, a number of intermediaries uh, or what's diplomatically referred to as um, uh, leakage uh, in certain governments. And I thought to myself, what a better way to eliminate leakage and middlemen and corruption uh, but technology. And because of uh, my position at the World Bank, I was able to invite people to come and speak to us, ranging from Vitalik Buterin, the founder of uh, Ethereum, to folks from R3 Corda and Hyperledger and the who's who of cryptocurrencies and blockchain uh, with the intention of taking World Bank uh, deployments of capital and blockchain enabling them to allow everyone to see in the ledger where the money was going, how it was being spent, and so forth. And that project is still currently at the World Bank. It's, it's ongoing. It just takes uh, a little bit of time. So that's what initially got me into uh, looking at, at this. And I think um, if done right, it could be very liberating. But if done poorly, as in the case of China, uh, it could be, well, very bad. And you're kind of no stranger to the Chinese reality. You actually, you know, lived there uh, doing finance-related work. Uh, my my for, three kids were born yeah. there, yes. Mm -hmm. so, so tell me, well, tell me a little bit about that, your background and like... I'm actually a product of the U.S. State Department. Uh, my dad was a career foreign service officer and he had met my mom, who was a Cuban foreign national working at the embassy in Havana in the 1950s. I grew up uh, in Miami and partially in Latin America and learned to speak English actually later on in life. I, I grew up speaking Spanish until I was uh, seven or eight. When I finished my tour of duty uh, as a naval officer, my first job was at Morgan Stanley uh, doing uh, Latin America work. They deemed that I sort of looked like a Morgan Stanley banker, but I could speak Spanish, and so they threw me in that uh, arena. Now, along the way, I was asked to join a private equity fund uh, in China. And I thought, hmm, this is interesting. And I went to China for the first time expecting to see a version of Mexico City or Sao Paulo. But what I saw in China was actually something far greater, uh, which was a billion and a half people working, getting ahead and growing their economy. And I saw a sense of optimism. And I said, this is going to be very interesting to see how this evolves. And this was sort of in the mid 2000s. My wife and I moved, uh, moved there and we spent the next seven years uh, living in Shanghai. Uh, our three kids were born there and uh, we learned uh, a great deal about um, the Chinese culture, the obviously the language, the food. And, and, and I grew uh, very fond of the Chinese people. Having said that, uh, I'm not as fond of the Chinese Communist Party. So that's kind of the China side, and I'd love to sort of build on that a little bit. I think I want to get you to talk about how you see the Chinese financial reality today. Before we go there, um, I want to talk a little bit about 
this Chinese digital yuan that's about to be deployed, right? Let's begin with what is a digital currency? Uh, people have fanciful notions of what, what it is or what it isn't, and it's conflated with a lot of different things. So a central bank digital currency, which is what, what we're going to talk about here, is not a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, right? Nor is it a so-called stable coin like Tether. It's not Venmo. It's a legal obligation of a central bank. It is legal tender, just in digital form. So if you were to take a dollar, physical dollar bill, and reduce it to its digital equivalent, that's what that is. It's an IOU of the central bank. Something like 90% of the world's GDP, their central bankers are looking into a digital form of their own physical money. And the one that's furthest along is, drum roll, China. Uh, and they've been at this for, uh, for eight years. The final point I'll make on this is um, that this is an inevitability, as far as I'm concerned. Just like cassette tapes became uh, CDs that became Spotify, there's going to come a point in time where we're going to look back on coins and bills as super anachronistic, right? This is, remember yesteryear, and we were going to see them in museum pieces when we actually had pieces of paper. So it's inevitable. Now, back to China. During the Olympics, they're going to launch their digital currency. This is a surveillance tool, and it's disguised as a payment mechanism. It's going to allow the People's Bank of China, their central bank, to um, look into, peer into everyone's purchasing history. And so you might say to yourself, hey, dude, whatever, I'm just buying Chardonnay and sushi. But what if you're not, right? What if you're, um, what if you're an ethnic or religious minority in China? What if you purchase a Bible in China? There are hundreds of millions of Christians living in China in house churches. Maybe they give money to their pastor. Uh, there are a lot of ways that the Chinese government could, could use this as an instrument of surveillance, tying it to their social credit score, and ultimately keeping an authoritarian regime uh, alive, in effect, forever. And that's very frightening. And just very briefly, um, because there may be a few people out there who are not familiar with China's social credit system that's you know, active right now, if you could just explain that. Yeah, this isn't a science fiction episode, uh, a Black Mirror episode. Uh, this is reality where uh, right now you have a credit score similar to what you'd have in, in the United States, right? If you want to get a mortgage, you look at your credit score. But imagine everything in your life, whether or not you jaywalk, um, whether or not you, you pay your taxes on time, everything you do is processed and you're given a, a rating. And, uh, and that rating determines whether or not you can travel or not. So uh, tens of millions of people in China over the last several years have been denied travel to visit their relatives because their social credit score wasn't high. Now, imagine if you are a, a, a dissident. For all practical intents and purposes, you don't exist. So that is the social credit score. Now, tack on you know, the money element, and, uh, and you can see how worrisome it could be for people. And you don't exist, do you mean by that that you have to try to pretend you don't exist because you don't want to, that system to be picking up your activities? Or what did you mean by that exactly? Well, you can be canceled. Uh, and, uh, you know, let's assume uh, you want to get married. Do you think someone is going to want to marry me if I have a low credit score? That means I can't really effectively get a good job. I'm not eligible to be a Chinese Communist Party member. Perhaps I can't buy a house. Uh, perhaps I can't travel. Uh, and so for all practical intents and purposes, uh, I'm canceled. 